Welcome to the screencast on how to file reply comments with the FCC in the matter of accessibility of user interfaces and video programming guides and menus. The screencast is intended for PEG Access TV managers to help and encourage them to file in this, this proceeding deadline August 7th. We've got two sections of this screencast. The first, about two minutes long, is exactly how to file and what to file. The, the, page you need to go to to upload your comments. The second section, maybe eight minutes long, is some of the context of the proceeding, the bill from 2010, the, the law that it stems from, some of the comments that have already been filed by PEG Access TV ad advocates. Um, First, uh, I need to explain I am a newbie at screencasting. This is my first time, so uh, please pardon any uh, stumbles. Uh, I'm going to try to go through these screens rather fast, and <clears throat> all of the uh, URLs for the pages that you're shown here will uh, appear in order in the description section below. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is go to the website at the FCC where you would actually file your comments. Now this URL will appear in the descriptors list. This is the FCC's electronic comment filing system, and you're going to be filling out this form, Submit a Filing. First of all, in the proceeding, uh, the Media Bureau docket number is 12108. You're going to put that there. You're going to add your contact info for the name of the filer, um, a law firm if uh, you're represented by counsel, the attorney and author or author name, and um, the appropriate email address. In the details, leave everything blank except type of filing. Here you're going to select from the drop-down menu, Reply to Comments. That's right there. And everything else in the details section is blank. For the address, put in the mailing address for either the, you, the filer, the law firm, or the author if um, that's appropriate. And finally, uh, in the document section, you're going to browse, use this to browse your local drives to find the PDF file that you've made of your comments. You can add a description there if you like. If not, just skip that. Now, once you do all that, you're going to click on Continue. And when you do that, you're going to have the opportunity to review your, uh, your form for correctness. And if you like what you've got, then you simply click the Submit button. You get an automated response from FCC, and you should save that for your records. And that is how you uh, file a comment. What should you file? What are you looking for? What are we looking for? Here's an example of uh, comments that have been filed from uh, Metro Television Eugene, Oregon. And you can go to this uh, on a Google Drive. Uh, again, the URL is down below. It uh, identifies the, um, the proceeding number and name that, the, that it's about. It simply describes who the access provider is, something about the nature of their programs, how many hours, um, and then it talks about how their video programming is not included on the on-screen uh, program guides of their cable system. And that is essentially the three points that need to be made in these comments. Who are you? What, what, what area do you serve? Uh, what your programming looks like, um, if there any of it is closed caption? And uh, to what extent it is or is not uh, described appropriately in the on-screen uh, programming guide of the cable systems that are carrying your programming. Now, Montgomery County and the Alliance for Community Media have put together a template that describes uh, what this uh, content needs to be. And I'm not going to go over this other than to point it out right now. Uh, on the second page, I will point out that there is a paragraph, especially if your programming is carried on the AT&T UVerse system. That's the system where all of the local access channels in an area are tossed into uh, channel 99 and you have to use an on-screen menu to navigate. Uh, they don't have closed captioning. They don't have uh, programming guides. and. Um, it's a real shame and it's important if your channel is 
on one of those systems to let the FCC know that. And that is a pointer to how you can make the comments that you would uh, apply. Now, w let's look at some of the background for the law itself. So, all of this stems from the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010. What's that? Well, let's come down and put that into Google, and we see that uh, there's a lot there to look at. Uh, I've preloaded some pages here. We see from GovTrack that it was sponsored by Senator Mark Pryor, and the full title, A Bill to Increase the Access of Persons with Disabilities to Modern Communications and for Other Purposes. We can find the remarks by the president at the signing, and if you like, there's a nine-minute YouTube video that you can watch of the signing. We see that this was sponsored by, um, supported by groups like the Coalition for Organizations for Accessible Technology and the National Association of the Deaf. Um, but importantly, um, we see that the FCC has a guide page on the act which uh, gives us a background paragraph and bullet points about Title I, Communications Access, and Title II, Video Programming. And the FCC also has an encyclopedia regarding <coughs> the Act. Again, a few more paragraphs on describing what the Act is. And then a set of notifications and uh, of various proceedings regarding the Act uh, presented in reverse chronological order. And we are going to take a look at the notice of proposed rulemaking that was issued this May on May 30th. And the notice of proposed rulemaking right there, open that in a new tab. And we see, we see this. Uh, comment date 25 days after publication. Uh, this actually turns out to be, um, if we go back here, the comment dates were um, comments. Initial comments were due July 15, and the reply comments due August 7. So let's take a look at some of the comments that have come in. Stand by. So some of the comments that have come in. We take a look at quickly here, the Alliance for Communications Democracy, 14 page um, comment, the Alliance for Community Media, four pages, the National Association of Counties, uh, the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, NOTOA, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and Montgomery County, Maryland, and we're going to look at CAN TV, Chicago Access Network Television. But let's start with the Alliance for Communications Democracy. Now, we're not going to uh, take, um, written by James Horwood and Tillman Lay at Spiegel and McDermott. We're not going to take the time to read their comments, but take a look just at the table of contents. One, PEG channel programming deserves equal treatment with all other real-time video programming channels under the CVAA. Two, AT&T's UVerse PEG product uniquely disadvantages the visually impaired. Three, the FCC has legal authority to require and should require cable operators and other MVPDs that carry PEG to provide programming description information for PEG channels and electronic program guides to promote accessibility for the visually and hearing impaired. What you may ask is an MVPD? Very good question. It is a multi-channel video programming distributor like cable operators, um, satellite um, TV, and um, wireline video providers such as Verizon Fios and um, AT&T UVerse, to name a few. Taking a look at the comments from the Alliance for Community Media, written by Executive Director Sylvia Strobel, come down past the description of who they are. And the Alliance for Community Media says many of our members carry programming on their channels, which includes closed captioning. Our members have program description and accessibility information readily available for many programs with accessibility options, such as closed captions. Unfortunately, the on-screen video programming guide of many of our members' multi-channel video programming distributors does not provide a label or symbol indicating that these programs have closed captions. 
This level of information is inadequate to meet the accessibility goals of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010. And if you just go down a little bit further, the ACM takes some time to describe uh, the inadequacies of the AT&T UVerse system. If we take a look at comments from NACO, NATOA, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors, scroll down to the bottom of their comments, the first page. In order to provide accessibility, the cable operator should require the, should be required to carry the program title as provided by the local government authority that produces local PED programs. Currently, many local PED programs are displayed on the on-screen menu and sim as simply local government access. An audible version of this description would not provide the visually impaired viewers sufficient information to make a meaningful program selection. The description local government access does not provide the visually impaired viewer any information as to the nature of the program and thus discourages civic engagement. Looking quickly at the comments from Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, I've preloaded a section there and um, they say MVPDs should be required to include channel and programming description information and information on accessibility options and programming guides for all channels, including local programs and channels for the purpose of promoting accessibility. And finally, our friends at CAN-TV, after describing who they are um, and a program that they produce called ADAPT of Chicago Productions. and. Um, um, come down to the second page, it says their program titles and descriptions are carried by Comcast, RCN, and WOW. Uh, while CAN's TV program descriptions can indicate which programs are closed captions, uh, uh, closed caption, people with auditory disabilities are not made aware of that distinction. Even more problematic for the disability community is that AT&T carries no listings for CAN TV programs on its electronic or print guides. AT&T's UVerse system clearly discriminates against people with disabilities who are seeking helpful local programming like ADAPT or Chris Radio. It is impossible for anyone from the disability community to make informed local choices based on AT&T's treatment of hundreds of PEG channels via Channel 99. The only identification of a multitude of different channels is a generic listing for local government, education, and public access. And that concludes a quick look at some of the PEG Access Advo Advocacy Organization's initial comments in this matter before the FCC. Now we're looking for reply comments by August 7 to help bolster the record. And we have just one more thing left to do, and then we will say goodbye. So here we go. The final two things to point out, this week I sent an e-blast to about 1,600 PEG access TV providers across the country, um, a two-pager describing this, and if you're interested in reading through um, the story as it was um, uh, put together in a uh, text narrative, please check out the uh, e-blast that I sent out. That's available on this um, Google Doc document. And finally, if you like this desktop image, you should know something about who took it, not me. Uh, there is a link to the photographer's uh, Flickr account and astronomy photo of the day where I found it. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and please send in those cards and letters to the FCC. Bye-bye.